I have to tell you, I, I spoke in church today. Oh. And I got up and I said, you know, I know a lot of people don't like to speak in church, but I actually like it, so <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so. Welcome to Gospel Tangents, the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. According to the Law of Moses, in order to hold the priesthood, one had to be a member of the tribe of Levi. Lehi was not a member of that tribe. So in the Book of Mormon, it says that Nephi built a temple like unto Solomon's temple. How would they do this without the priesthood? Historian Bradley will talk about Nephite priesthood in our next conversation and wonders if maybe some of that information was in the lost pages of the Book of Mormon. Check out our conversation. Hey, also, before you do that, I just want to mention, I know we like to get into a lot of history here. If you're into more modern history, check out Mormon News Report with Brant Malone and Jenny Noonan Dye. They uh, offer a healthy dose of snark and commentary with, along with the latest weekly news. So join Brant and Jenny every Monday to get caught up on all the top stories you need to stay up to date in Mormon News. So check that out. Brant and Jenny are awesome. Now back to our conversation. Well, another topic that I, I wanted to talk a little bit about, which I thought found really interesting, yeah. was this discussion of Nephite priesthood. Oh, okay, yeah. Because as we as we look at it, you know, in, in the Bible, primarily you had to be of the tribe of Levi in order to hold the priesthood. Yeah. So then the question is, Neph uh, Nephi built a temple, the temple of, uh, like unto Solomon. Yeah. Um, so how did he get priesthood? Yeah. And so that comes from the Lost Pages, apparently. The evidence that we have about what was in the Lost Pages really particularly covers the um, early part of the Lost Pages, the Lehi and Nephi narratives, and then the late part of the Lost Pages, so like the, the ending stories of King Mosiah the First, King Benjamin, and so on. We've mm -hmm. got some material in between, but not as much. If you look at those early, the clues about the early narratives of Lehi and Nephi that we were missing, they tend to cluster around certain themes. And those themes are themes of exile and restoration. And so um, the, you know, Lehi, and I talked about this last time, um, so, like, um, you know, the Book of Mormon starts right at the beginning of the exile. That's how Zedekiah's reign commences, is mm -hmm. actually the beginning of the exile. The old king is exiled. Uh, a lot of the people, the notables of the city are exiled. And um, there are, you know, uh, still most of the common folks are left in Jerusalem for several more years before there's another Babylonian invasion that completes the exile and destroys the temple, destroys the Davidic monarchy, and so on. So all these things that are lost in the exile uh, need to be restored or replaced in the new promised land, including, in fact, the very fact of having a promised land. So, so the promised land, right, uh, was had been promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and, Mos and Moses, right? He, uh, Moses leads the Israelites to this promised land, that promised land is being lost now because of exile. They have to leave. And so what are they promised a new land. So they replaced the old promised land, they replaced the sacred city, they replaced the temple with a temple that's like Solomon's temple. They explicitly say that Nephi's temple is like Solomon's, right? They replaced David's dynasty with Nephi's dynasty. They replaced the sacred relics of the temple with their own sacred relics. They also have to replace the temple priesthood uh, the, the priesthood of the temple was not optional for living the law of Moses, right? So all through the Book of Mormon, they're saying, and until Christ comes, we scrupulously keep the law of Moses. We keep it as looking forward to Christ, right? They're well, quite they emphatic about They had to replace it because this. they left, right? And they right. didn't have any Levites with them. Right. If they would have had Levites with them, they would have had priesthood with them. Right, 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 right. But since they were a family... Of, of Josephites, right? Ephraimites, Manassehites, no Levites. Um, they needed to have another way of having priesthood. And if you look at clues, and, and there's, there's, because the Lost Pages, we can tell, develop themes of temple more, as I lay out in uh, chapter uh, 11 of my book. And because the... Um, Lost Pages 
also they're, they're very Hebraic and they deal with these themes of exile and restoration, there's every reason to believe that they would be more explicit than our extant text is about the nature of Nephite temple priesthood. But the, the extant text has a lot of information implicitly, right? You've got to read the text closely. And so as we do that, we can see that there's a different model of priesthood than Levitical priesthood. There is no evidence in the Book of Mormon of a special set-apart priestly lineage, right? What, um, and so the high priest is not a descendant of Levi. The high priest in the Book of Mormon text that we have even is the king. So uh, when, before they um, abolish the kingship, right, and start the reign of the judges, the ultimate figure always in stories about the priests is the king. The guy who consecrates priests, including a high, like a, a, a leader among, a chief priest, right, like a quote-unquote high priest, is the king. So the true high priest, the highest priest, the one who has the power to ordain all the others, to tell them what to do, the one who builds the temples, in each case where a temple is built, it's built by the king, Right? And then the king is the one who consecrates the priest. He's the high priest. And so that model of priesthood, where you have a king who is a priest, that has biblical precedent. And the precedent is not ancient Israel's Levitical priesthood. The precedent goes back earlier to the time of Abraham, when you have Melchizedek, who is portrayed as a king and a priest. So the idea of people being ordained kings and priests, with the gendered equivalent of which might be queens and priestesses, right? Like, might be familiar to some people associated with Mormonism. I don't know, maybe. <laughs> but like, the model for that, and one that Joseph Smith explicitly invokes in Nauvoo, talking about people being made kings and priests, queens and priestesses, is Melchizedek. And so the model of priesthood among the Lehites, the Nephites, is not Levitical, they replace a Levitical model of priesthood with a Melchizedek model of priesthood. And, and of course, those, <laughs> those terms, right, Levitical or Aaronic and Melchizedek are so familiar to Latter-day Saints, but they're kind of familiar to us mostly in a different context that would give a different twist on what they mean, right? That the model of priesthood here is Melchizedek in the, sen in the biblical sense of Melchizedek being both king and high priest. So that's that's the Nephite model of priesthood. Okay, so so they so they go I mean I guess the the question that comes up for me then is when we think about um, about priesthood, you know, in in our in our church we think that um, Peter, James, and John came down, or John the Baptist first, yeah. and then Peter, James, and John, yeah. to, to restore that because certainly there were no Levites in Joseph's day. Yeah. Um, was there some sort of a similar thing, or was it just because Nephi was the king that he said, okay, I'm going to go adapt this Melchizedek, King Melchizedek model of priesthood? Is that what happened? So I was oversimplifying, actually, when I said that the Israelite biblical model of priesthood was Levitical because there are actually signs that there are at least two models of priesthood in the Hebrew Bible in ancient Israel. And one of them is the key, uh, actually a kingly model of priesthood. So there are Psalms that are uh, applied to Jesus, but they originally applied to the Davidic kings, David and his successors. And they say things like, thou art a, a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. That's thought to have been part of the coronation ceremony for the Israelite kings. They're actually ordained Melchizedek priests. That's part of their office. So, so what I'm saying is it was part and parcel of, and, and the kings are actually portrayed in the Hebrew Bible narratives as performing sacrifices. Solomon goes and performs sacrifices, and there's nothing said against it. It's treated as completely legitimate. Right? Solomon builds the temple. Solomon perform sacrifices in the temple. Sure, he's a priest after the order of Melchizedek. That's part, of, that's part and parcel of being king. So when Nephi acquires legitimate kingship, when God chooses him to be king, part and parcel of that is Melchizedek 
priesthood. And, and there may be other... Um, Lehi is already performing sacrifices out in the wilderness um, before Nephi's king, right? And when they leave Jerusalem, which suggests on the one hand that they may be rejecting the Jerusalem temple as polluted and corrupted, right? So they're off doing their own thing in the wilderness. Hmm. That suggests that Lehi is already perceived as having some sort of authority to do this. So uh, undoubtedly there's, there's an even bigger... There are even other conceptions of priesthood and a bigger sort of backstory. Um, Richley Crapo, I don't know if you know him. Um, I've seen him on Facebook. Cultural right. anthropologist at Utah State. He actually just did a very good um, article on um, in the journal Interpreter on um, like kind of like Josephite or Northern Kingdom traditions of priesthood independent of the Levitical priests. Um, that could be seen as interplaying with the whole idea of like Lehi's own Josephite priesthood hmm. and so on. Well, that's really interesting. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with historian Don Bradley. In our next conversation, we'll talk about one of the most mysterious objects in the Book of Mormon, the Liahona. Don says that there were pictures on this round ball. Well, the pictures around that central circle could be pictures telling what it's pointing to. So one one pointer could point to, you know, picture of wild game, right? And then another pointer points the direction. So so the the function of the twin the two spindles, right, would be it points them to something and it also tells them what it's pointing them to. If you'd like to hear the entire interview uncut Please support Gospel Tangents and become a subscriber. For just $5 a month, go to uh, patreon.com slash gospel tangents and you can hear the entire interview. And you can also get uh, transcripts available at either our Amazon website or if you want to give the money to me and not Amazon, please subscribe on my website at gospeltangents.com and you can click the yellow subscribe button. Of course, we're also on Facebook, Twitter, and all the other places. Uh, make sure you subscribe on iTunes at tinyurl.com slash gospel tangents. And don't forget to click here to subscribe on YouTube here for a transcript. And over here we've got some more of our great videos. Thanks again for listening.